Good evening, my friends. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattoo Historian's Facebook and YouTube channel. We really appreciate you hanging out with us this evening, and we hope that you are safe and well. Happy New Year to everyone who uh, is here for the first time. Thank you again for joining us tonight. We have Alexander Hughes on with us. Alex, good evening. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, Alex is a six-year PhD candidate in the Department of History at York University. His soon-to-be defended dissertation, Lake Effect Pizza, Pizza Culture and Consumption in Toronto, Ontario, and Buffalo, New York, 1945 to 1990, explores the commodification of pizza in two transborder cities. He served as the curator of the History of Pizza exhibit at the Canadian Pizza Museum, which I'm going to ask about that because that sounds fascinating. It makes me hungry just thinking about it. He has a master's from Wilfrid Laurier University, where his thesis examined representations of U.S. history in Disneyland Park. His research interests include post-war Canada and the United States, urban food, business, and cultural history. Alex, that's quite a paragraph. There's a lot in there, my man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Even when I commenced work on this project, um, it may be about pizza, but it really became the history of everything. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, I, I'm working on something that's made of dough, sauce, and cheese, but I find myself, I was researching video games at one point. I'm researching mm -hmm. immigration patterns. I'm trying to understand how franchise businesses work. I was looking at court cases. I was looking into uh, petty crime. <laughs> I was all over the place and Man. I go, it's not just about the pizza. There's a lot more than just the slice is what I really discovered. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, even in Toronto and Buffalo themselves, two cities that we in 2022 look at as complete opposites, but right. you know, they exist within a regional structure. And at one point we're pretty similar cities. Hmm. That's, uh, that's 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 fascinating in itself to think that Buffalo and Toronto at one time were pretty similar. Yeah. So if we look at both cities in 1950, um, they had comparable urban populations. Don't ask me the number off the top of my head. <laughs> um, they had comparable uh, patterns of Italian immigration to their cities. They both served as transportation hubs. Um, Mm. On the Great Lakes, we have to think that as maritime route and as railroad uh, linkages to the inland, uh, they both had manufacturing industries. And we have to remember that's ultimately what caused Buffalo's demise was the failure of its uh, manufacturing industries. But these two cities that we look at now as complete opposites did have these similar characteristics uh, very early on. I mean, they're an hour and a half apart an hour and a half drive uh, down the QEW and you cross one of the bridges uh, over to uh, Western New York. Mm -hmm. And to think that they're that close, but that different. And what I originally noticed was how different the pizza was in the two spaces. And right. that's where this project initially started was going, each city has its own style of pizza. And mm -hmm. From there, I started unfolding and figuring out, well, it's not just the pizza that's different. It's the whole industry. It's the way people were first introduced to pizza. It's the way um, people eat pizza, where they eat pizza. Mm -hmm. That was completely different city to city. And I mean, I use two cities very close within the same region, but it's that transnational aspect that ultimately changes why pizza is different in each city. Mm. How, how does how does one become a pizza historian? That's what I want to know. And I know a lot of people are asking this because I'm sure there are people out there who love a certain food or are into something that's a niche kind of thing. And they think they can't really do anything with it. And it's like pizza historian is a great thing to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a fluke that I ended up in this position as a pizza historian. Um, I mean, the real joke is I'm lactose intolerant and I can't <laughs> eat too much pizza anymore. <laughs> but um, what what I ultimately got to this project was I started my PhD. I was working on a completely different project, but my supervisor had suggested very early on in my PhD that I take the Canadian history field course. Now, I hadn't touched Canadian history since my second year of my 
undergrad uh, doing one of those required courses. Right. And she said, you know, you should really think about taking the Canadian history course. So I did. Mm -hmm. And I found while I was taking that course, I went, hey, I actually really like Canadian history. Now, my original uh, PhD topic was very US centric. And I had often thought of myself as a US historian, mm -hmm. always thought of myself as a cultural historian, but US historian, I was pretty fixed on that geography. And midway through the first year of my PhD, my supervisor said, have you considered rethinking your thesis topic? And I went, hmm. And I had gone home and I was watching, there was a great series on Vice, um, Vice Media back then, uh, The Pizza Show, where Frank Pinello, yeah. who owns uh, Best Pizza in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, would yeah. go around, not, and back at that time, he only went different boroughs of New York, he'd go to New Jersey, he'd go to Connecticut, and he'd go, hey, look how different this pizza is. And <laughs> I went, okay, that's kind of cool. There's a geographic uh, element to pizza and in the United States. And I started considering, well, is there a difference between Canadian and American styles of pizza? Right. And so I started looking at cities and I really, at this point, I knew I wanted to do some sort of transborder study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the dissertation was originally going to be Windsor, Ontario, Detroit, which are shared by the Ambassador Bridge there, right. um, Toronto and Buffalo, and then I was going to do Montreal and maybe another American city out that way. Um, and I started going, well, that's six cities that, you know, <laughs> nobody can do that much research. So I boiled it down to the two closest and the two that, you know, I really started enjoying the history of the most. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I didn't enter thinking, you know, pizza would be my focus, but right. It's been such an adventure over the past six years to really work on this one food item. And mm -hmm. It's never been just about pizza, though. It's been about the people who make the pizza, the places people eat pizza, and those who consume pizza as well. Um, I mean, I learned more about ovens than I ever should in my life. I've mm -hmm. learned more about gluten and the food science behind the creation of dough than mm -hmm. anybody should ever learn. Um, this has really taken me all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this has to be, especially for the early days, right? This has to be also a largely immigrant story, right? Yeah, so pizza does really start out as an immigrant story. I mean, if we look at the first uh, pizzeria that pops up in the United States, it's 1897, um, Lombardi's in, on Spring Street in Lower Manhattan, New York City. And it was three brothers that had moved over uh, to New York. They had worked as bakers in Italy and had made pizza. And it's believed that they opened Lombardi's as the first pizzeria. Hmm. Now, the importance of that is everybody they hired is now a trained pizza maker. Right. So you're slinging dough in the back, you're feeding it into the oven, you now know how to make pizza. So now you're looking for your own economic opportunity. You open your own pizzeria. So it's early in New York City, but if we look at somewhere like Buffalo, it's actually 1927. Um, the first pizzeria in Buffalo was actually Santora's and it opened, it was a family's front window of their house. <laughs> so it wasn't a true pizzeria, like as we, you know, walk in, sit down type of thing. Right. It was this family's home and they lived on a street with many other Italian immigrants, actually often from the same town. Um, and they fed their neighbors through their front window who would buy their pizza. And, you know, as things caught on a bit more and more Italians moved to the town, um, purpose-built pizzerias opened. Um, mm -hmm. One of my other favorite stories out of Buffalo is actually Bocce Club. And Bocce Club... So in Buffalo, there's Santora's people, pizza people, and bocce club pizza people. Okay. Those were the original two, really. And the bocce club was the bocce club. <laughs> <laughs> so it was post-World War II, 1946, um, Italian service member or Italian American service members met at the bocce club, you know, mm -hmm. have drinks, um, eat sandwiches. It was originally sandwiches until um this guy i'm blanking on his name right now but 
he buys the bocce club and he discovers a pizza oven down in the basement and he goes hey this is cool i'm gonna start selling pizza as well right. and so he starts making pizza to serve with the beer and, and other things and uh, eventually it becomes popular not just amongst the italian americans in buffalo but everybody else starts going hey this is kind of cool i kind of like this um and opens an actual storefront in 1958. but where non-italians come to eat pizza is another big element that i had to figure out mm -hmm. and it's a completely different story in canada and the united states in the united states the two major factors towards non-italians eating italian food were prohibition and the great depression so under prohibition um italian restaurants continued to stomp their own grapes make their own wine and they were able to still serve because they had this home winemaking tradition they were still serving wine to customers so non-italians were going oh let's go down there and grab a drink right um and at the same time you know after a few glasses of wine you, you need something to settle your stomach and they started exploring the food as well yeah. um then during the great depression it's i need something that's cheaper and filling and so spaghettis canned sauces that kind of thing started being popularized in american diets and it was this gradual acceptance, not only of certain Italian foods, but Italians were also being accepted, not so much as outsiders anymore, but hey, maybe we can sample their other foods as well. And it was this slow movement of Italian restaurants slowly gaining popularity that, you know, ultimately explodes into frozen pizza, um, pizzerias on every corner and, you know, flash forward 30, 40 years you can't find a town without a pizzeria right in right. canada however things were a bit slower and what it came to be was actually recipes so um think like in newspapers and cookbooks that were presenting pizza as something that was nutritious quick to make and you could use convenience foods to help produce this so like using a biz quick uh, mm -hmm. base for your dough um, one of my favorite clips comes from the late 50s, and it's a CBC uh, homemaker show where um, each of these women came on and they were presenting recipes. Everybody did a casserole, except this Mrs. Brady comes on and Mrs. Brady goes, I'm here to make the pizza pie. <laughs> and she goes, she has this crazy, like super Canadian accent. And she's <laughs> going on about the pizza pie and how you can find it at the Pizzeria. Oh. And I think she ends up putting corned beef or something on her pizza and it looks absolutely disgusting. Oh my God. But it shows that Anglo Canadian homemakers were interested in this as something they could serve to their friends, like as an hors d'oeuvre when they come over, or it was a quick meal that you could use convenience food items to produce for your kids for dinner. Mm -hmm. um, so, what quickly follows are like pizza kits. So, Chef Boyardee um, produced a pizza kit that contain the base to make your dough, tomato sauce in a bag, and what I think is Parmesan cheese. It's very hard to tell because it's often just called zippy cheese. And yeah. that seems to be the way Canadians first started to explore pizza before getting to a pizzeria. Hmm. Wow. So, that's, that's, that's crazy because I've, on my trips up there, Sometimes when I was a kid, I like going to the supermarket up there and, and I'd be like, oh, we can't get this in the United States or we this is weird or whatever. And when I would go down to pizza, aisle, it was like, what is a fungi pizza? I never <laughs> heard of a fungi pizza. And it was like mushroom. And I'm like, oh, so so even then, even today, we're still seeing like this kind of thing where it's like, oh, OK, it's either said differently here culturally or it's produced slightly differently uh, than than. I'm used to here in the States. So there is still that kind of like, I'll get something different in Toronto than I will in Pittsburgh or, or something. Exactly. And I mean, with Toronto, there's the interesting element of this Great Lakes connection where some of the first pizzas that were coming in, like frozen pizzas uh, that were coming in came via Buffalo. So if we think of something like the Freezer Queen frozen food brand, mm -hmm. their headquarters or their production factory was actually in Buffalo. Uh, Loblaws, the grocer brand, also had one of their uh, had their American hub in Buffalo. 
So we can only assume it was Freezer Queen products were making their way up to the Canadian market through a corporation like Loblaws that was based in Buffalo. Uh, mm -hmm. Same with Totino's. Um, although we never actually got the pizza rolls up here until <laughs> very recently. It was wow. exciting for me. But, <laughs> yeah, um, I say, do I need to send you some, Alex? I, I mean, I'll <laughs> gladly accept a freeze-dried <laughs> bag of them. But uh, pizza, Totino's actually started setting up branch plant uh, factories in Canada where they actually mm -hmm. produce the pies differently than what you'd find in the U.S. Um, there, was a, there was this great claim from Mrs. Totino um, I remember out of the Toronto Star where she was like, Canadians like a blander meat. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> okay, Mrs. Totino, wow. thanks for that. Wow. Um, but believe it or not, there was a Mrs. Totino. <laughs> it was also a surprise. It's not like a Betty Crocker that was a fake figure. Um, yeah, yeah. How how did you start this research process when you when you made that transition, Alex? And you and you started to think about these different geographic regions and you settled on Toronto and, and Buffalo. How did you start the process of research other than like going and eating as many pieces of pizza as you can? Because that would be what I would do. So the first thing I actually did was I went into the archives and I took out uh, city directories. Mm -hmm. And every five years I traced the growth of pizzerias. So I took the name of every single pizzeria out of a city directory, a yellow pages, and eventually manufacturers guides. And I created this list of pizzerias. So I was able to kind of track them. Mm -hmm. And then from that, I put them into a GIS map. So I was able to overlay um, and figure out, okay, pizzerias obviously started near centers of Italian life um, in Toronto, Little Italy and Corso Italia, but then gradually start expanding with suburbanization. Um, Part of that movement is Italians started to leave the Italian neighborhoods and were moving to um, non-Italian neighborhoods and opening businesses um, as part of their ethnic economy going, you know, nobody else in this neighborhood knows how to make pizza, but we do. Right. So that was one of the first steps. And then it became a big newspaper dive. Um, mm. I searched the keyword pizza in every major newspaper in both Toronto and Buffalo which I think was close to 100,000 hits. And I clicked, through, a lot. I clicked through every single one. Um, so I have this big, crazy database where I was then applied a keyword to every single one that I found um, saying this relates to crime, this relates to business operation, this relates to, um, this is a grocery advertisement. So, I mean, if somebody really wanted to do the boring study of the price of pizzas, you know, 1950 to present, I have that data. I just did not want to touch that myself. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a future student you advise will be like that. <laughs> yeah, they, they can dig through that hard drive. I go, I don't want to touch that. But yeah. from that, I started f finding really cool things. And I was able to build business histories of some of these businesses. Or I was able to track something like um, there was actually prohibition. So the original... <laughs> Uh, restaurant original pizzeria in Toronto, Vesuvios, opened 1957 um, on Dundas Street in the Junction neighborhood. And the Junction, even as it was swallowed and Junction becomes a part of uh, York, then mm -hmm. Etobicoke, so on and so forth, um, there was still prohibition on that street. And we're talking right up into the 80s. And tons of local plebiscites take place and, you know, they keep the neighborhood dry that, you know, the restaurants can't serve booze. And I find this fantastic story about how Vesuvio's business ultimately starts crumbling because they couldn't serve alcohol with their uh, food and their customers are demanding that. So they ultimately end up closing their, their restaurant and it becomes a little takeout window. And it's not until the 90s when, you know, prohibitions actually lifted there and they can start serving booze uh, that they reopen as a uh, restaurant space. Hmm. And as I was writing this and I'm discovering all this, they actually closed because of COVID-19. Uh, I was just going to ask that. It destroyed their business. So wow. that was the original pizzeria was gone actually the day I started and sat down writing that. So it was around April 20th, 2020. Wow. I was just going to ask that because I immediately thought of, okay, they've had this one setback and it's impacted their business. And now obviously we're getting this impact uh, in the modern era. How did that impact these kind of like 
I don't want to use the term mom and pops, but they're not a chain. So how does it? Yeah. So the independent pizzeria is that that was something I started to notice um, really over the past two years. And it's something I've tried to make note of mm -hmm. is that a lot of these places I'm writing about cease to exist now. Um, off the top of my head, there's at least three or four, but it's not just the independents. What I discovered actually, so uh, Buffalo only ever had really one uh, conglomerate or big franchise stay, and that was Pizza Hut. And Pizza Hut actually operated as a loss leader in Buffalo. Um, I think they grew up to about 12 restaurants over the years. But they operated as a loss leader to prevent any other franchise from coming into the town. <laughs> and what actually ultimately happens under COVID, so I think it was around June 2020, they closed all their remaining Pizza Huts um, in Buffalo. So... Oh. It, it, it's it's been an interesting era to be writing the history of these restaurants as you know a lot of them are starting to fold mm -hmm. yeah uh, you've 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 mapped them out for the long term which is actually going to save that history more than you thought you would you know <laughs> i originally had mapped that just to help myself you know right. to spatially understand where pizzerias were opening and where they were moving to but in the long term, that's something, you know, that will serve as that record of a pizzeria once existed there. And as the case seems to be in Toronto, they seem to be becoming dispensaries now, uh, these mm. former uh, pizzerias. Mm. But, um, yeah, I somehow created historical record as I was going through this project. No, it's awesome. Because, like I said, a lot of people wouldn't think of having, wouldn't think that it would be possible to have a dissertation topic like this i don't it's one of those things where we don't think of food history when everything has a history including food and uh some people just don't think about it and i and i love the fact that it's not just food history it's the it's the economy it's it's immigration it's it's a culture 101 basically. yeah i mean what ultimately happens when people often think of food history they start thinking of it as the nutritional elements the production the um, what type of oven was used. And I go, all of that is important or how people ate or where they ate. That is all important. But you have to remember at the end of the day, food is a big business as well. There is this interesting economic element. There's this immigration element to it as well. Um, there's a lot going on. So, I mean, there's so many foods that you could take that history of mm -hmm. and discover there's this way longer history. And I go, even though I was working on one food item, like I started writing it at one time. Uh, hot dogs became an important part of the pizza story. I mean, Chinese food becomes an important part. Food trucks become an important part. So I found myself even researching about ice cream trucks one day because that has a part of the history that needs to be told as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because if we think about it, and I'll just explain ice cream trucks quick they're on the streets, right? They were mobile. They're taking food to the people. Mm -hmm. Well, pizza delivery eventually emulates that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the concept of eating outside of the home mm -hmm. that becomes this drawn out element. Do you, do you think that that um, creates a lot more opportunity for you personally as a historian and that you could take this in so many directions <laughs> but at the same time with the dissertation you have to kind of stay focused one way but you're like wow i just found this really cool thing that's going on over here in buffalo or in toronto which is really an interesting story in itself have you made have you found like you could do probably like a dozen or two dozen like articles out of this because it's just it doesn't fit the dissertation but still an amazing pizza story definitely like i mean i got into um things as simple as the corrugated um cardboard box <laughs> i got so deep into that and the <laughs> patent history behind the creation of that box or yeah. um the pizza table the little pizza saver yeah that was a little history i got really deep into um something i don't actually look at in the dissertation is organized crime. And that's something that I may get to eventually. Um, it's definitely an element of the pizza industry, um, but it, that would have been, you know, way much, way further than I wanted to take things. Yeah, yeah. What's what's your uh, favorite pizza joint in Toronto? Um, I really like Il Pisano. It's on Brown's Line. Um, one, it's just really close to me. 
But uh, the big thing about them was they're actually the third oldest pizzeria in the city. And wow. they don't deserve that recognition. And I mean, the owner didn't actually know that until I wrote an article about them for Canadian Pizza Magazine. He went, oh, yeah. really? We're the third oldest operational? And I go, <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think that's just the pizza I grew up with. I mm -hmm. really enjoy theirs. Um, if we're going with a big chain, um, definitely um, Pizza Nova. Uh, okay. They were graciously one of my oral history participants. So, I mean, there's that element to it, but I really enjoy their pizza. You yeah. can still really, there is that quality and care that's put into it, unlike uh, certain big franchises where it tastes like eating the box. Right. Right. Yeah. You don't know if you're eating <laughs> the box on the bottom when it's actually the crust. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's really awesome because we talked about that uh, oldest entity closing down due to COVID. And it's like, OK, I can't go to that one. So <laughs> which one is the one to kind of gravitate towards? And I've been through, you know, the Italian district in Toronto and, and other places. So it's really interesting to think that you can make this almost like a. I think you have uh, or you were in a pre COVID era or you're going to uh, where you could almost make it like a walking tour or something where it's like, hey, this is a pizzeria and at this point in time. And this one was, too. And this, these people did outside their front window. That's something I hope to do eventually um, yeah. in a post COVID era. Definitely. Um, but one of the issues is that, you know, they've either disappeared Right. Or that the ones that I really like, you need to drive between. <laughs> oh, yeah. so it need to be a van tour or something, not like New York, you know, where yeah. you go block to block and there's a historical pizzeria right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. This would definitely be like 20 minute drive, 20 minute drive, 20 minute drive. But right. And there's Toronto. definitely something yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. And a 20 minute drive in Toronto could be four blocks. Exactly. It depends. Yeah. Uh, we have some people in here who, who, who are from the Buffalo area. Uh, I've not found any pizza I like anywhere I've traveled. Hardcore Buffalo pizza fan. Thank you. It, for you help. know, that's a funny one, too, because everybody likes their local pizza. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, it can come down to something as simple as the water that's used to make it. Um, right. Or make the dough is something yeah. that you're particular to. Um, you know, even though I've dedicated so many years now to writing Buffalo pizza, I, <laughs> there's certain places I don't like in Buffalo pizza wise mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but there's also ones i really do enjoy i mean i've had both bocce club and santora and i really enjoy both their slices but it's definitely different than what i eat here at home mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i mean even like the hawaiian pizza which I, you and i were joking about before we started mm -hmm. um i it's the most canadian pizza in my opinion um really yeah, so okay. the quick history behind that one. Yeah, I want to hear this. So it was created in Chatham, Ontario. Uh, this oh. guy named Sam uh, Sam Panopoulos owned this restaurant called Satellite Restaurant. Okay. And Satellite Restaurant was not a pizzeria by any means. He served Chinese food. He served hamburgers. He served eventually pizza. And so Chatham, Ontario was out towards London. So if we're thinking of... Uh, Southwestern Ontario, it's like Toronto, London in the middle, and then Windsor down the end. Mm -hmm. And Panopolis would actually drive over to Detroit, which is where he first samples pizza. And he goes, oh, man, this is pretty fantastic. And he's playing around in his kitchen. So one day he's making Chinese food and he, he goes, oh, I really like how the pineapple exists in like a sweet and sour meal. Mm -hmm. And so he threw pineapple on the pizza and starts serving it with uh, ham. And he goes, oh, this is pretty good. And it starts growing like a local following. Well, that local following starts spilling out. And it starts spilling across, across southwestern Ontario, appearing in tons of pizzerias. I mean, <laughs> there's still people, you know, a lot of very um, rooted in history Italian pizzerias that will refuse to serve it. But I mean, <laughs> right. a lot of others go, it's customers. I'll serve it. I don't care. Yeah. Um by the time it actually spills over to Buffalo, um, if you look at Lenova uh, Pizza in Buffalo, they put maraschino cherries on their Hawaiian pizza, which, I mean, that disturbs me a little bit. <laughs> wow. That is weird. Okay. And, I mean, yeah. in all, all these years now, I've had like over 700 slices over the past 600 or six years now. And I go, I, I feel like I'm an authority now on what pizza tastes good. And I can right. tell you maraschino cherries. No, thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, that that does not sound appealing. But oh, when we're talking about this weird this ex experimentation on pizza, that's one of the cool features of the Great Lakes region is that we have these real unique styles appear. So the Hawaiian being one, uh, the white pie being another that exists mm -hmm. in Buffalo and didn't really come up to Toronto until late '90s, but came under a different reason. Um, I mean, we also have the California style pizza. So if we think uh, it, that's often attributed to um, Wolfgang Puck at Spago in Beverly oh, Hills. Yeah. Um, recently, a documentary came out about Wolfgang on Disney Plus. I think it was called Wolfgang. And it never actually mentions the chef that he hired to create uh, the California style pizza or the smoked salmon pizza. Um, so I'd like to plug Ed Ledoux. Ed Ledoux is the godfather of what we call the California pizza, um, which came to the, came to Toronto in the 80s, uh, never actually made it to Buffalo. Um, higher cost pizza, you know, you're getting into more extravagant toppings like snow peas, goat cheese, figs all over the place, balsamic. Um, and that really came down to Toronto growing as a center of middle class, um, a center of commerce. The city really starts booming and its citizens could support that. Um, mm -hmm. Buffalo, not so much at that point. Buffalo industry has gone. Um, you couldn't quite support an extravagant pizza there. Yeah. Um, and everybody's other favorite pizza that I love to mention, McDonald's pizza. Yes. I now, had it when I was a kid. I, I've never actually, I've had it once. Okay. But not, not the original McDonald's pizza. I've had it at one oh. of the two locations that it remains at in Orlando. Oh, okay. Um, I, had, I had it in Canada. So, okay, yeah. Okay, so question for you. Yes. Did you have it in a restaurant or did you have it at the Sky Dome while watching the Blue Jays? No, I had it in a restaurant. Okay. I still have yet to get to the Sky Dome uh, or to, to, the, uh, to, the, to see the Jays game. Uh, that was one of the only... I don't think it was in every location, right? It was like a, a yeah. They, so they were trying to do like an experiment kind of thing, like how's this going to go over? And one of them was in Arnprior, outside Ottawa. Yes, uh, my wife grew up in the Ottawa area and remembers um, McDonald's pizza. But yeah. one of the real kickers. So when Sky Dome opens, um, when it's first built, the Blue Jays move from Exhibition Stadium over to Sky Dome. The food contract was actually given exclusively to McDonald's. So everybody in the stadium was consuming McDonald's pizza before McDonald's pizza was more widely available. Oh, wow. Um, McDonald's pizza went through all these crazy variations. It started at one point like a calzone when it was first product tested. Mm -hmm. um, it was a calzone that was sold in Philadelphia only. Um, <laughs> then it becomes personal pizzas. And then yeah. it becomes a large like table size pizza. Mm. And their whole goal there was to draw in customers that they didn't expect would come into McDonald's for dinner. Now, it's ultimate demise. One, it required special machinery. You know, it wasn't the standard conveyor belt type system right. uh, that McDonald's was used to. Right. And it took too long. I think it took between 8 and 11 minutes to produce a McDonald's pizza, which, yeah. I mean, that's really quick. But when you're used to your burger being made in 30 seconds what good is a nine, 10 minute pizza? Right. Yeah. I had the personal pan size ones. That's the only ones I remember uh, being there, but I remember, I remember that. I, I didn't think of it until we started talking and I'm like, Oh yeah. I remember McDonald's pizza back, back in the day. And you know what? It was actually a bit of a threat to the pizza industry. Really? Um, when it came in, a few of the big franchises actually put out, um, slapbacks actually at mcdonald's in the newspaper where they were saying stick to burgers pizza's our game um i th believe it was pizza Hut actually put that one out wow um and they were like going their pizzas are actually frozen so that was one of the big fights as well yeah see that's what that's what happens when the haters come out <laughs> they, they just want to advertise this stuff that's when you know you're winning exactly <laughs> you know when you have them running scared they will usually talk about you Exactly. Uh, I, I I do want to give a shout out to Fran. She is actually uh, that that Lenovo. <laughs> it's very unappetizing. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Karen. Thank you. Love McDonald's pizza, original style. I uh, had it at the Eaton Center. Oh, oh okay. So the Eaton right. Center down in the food court uh, must have is. had it at one point. There it is. Uh, that that's 
that's fascinating. I didn't know he put out ads kind of like. Oh, so. yeah. And it was like all this back and forth actually in the business section um, where it was like spokesperson for Pizza Hut Canada says. And then I remember Domino's came after them. Quite a few of the big franchises actually started coming after them when they released wow. pizza, which wow. was very unexpected. Wow. The one that I see the most of when I'm visiting is, is Pizza Pizza. And that started in Toronto as well, didn't it? Yeah. So Pizza Pizza was created by Michael Overs, um, who was not Italian. Um, mm -hmm. It was one of the first big franchises to appear in the city. And what Overs did was he opened. OK, so let's start with the name Pizza Pizza. Right. Originally, it was Pizza Pizza Pizza. Okay. And he only did that because he opened uh, close to Ryerson Polytechnical, now X University. Um, and he thought it would be funny to have late night students coming in after a few drinks and make them say the name. <laughs> and so what he does is he starts expanding locations. Uh, and how he really secured the market was he gets this central ordering phone number. And you have to remember that was pretty rare, this 967-1111 number. Mm -hmm. And what he does is he makes it, every order for Pizza Pizza goes through this number. He buys this complex uh, computer system. He has dispatchers. He has a flying squad of emergency drivers, emergency pizza makers to go into locations to always make sure they could adhere to this 30 minutes or it's free policy. Mm -hmm. And it was that that allowed this rapid expansion. I mean, the marketing even for that phone number, it was on t-shirts, it was on the side of buses, it was on the radio. You know, everybody really started to learn that. In fact, Pepsi, uh, who actually owned Pizza Hut in Canada and Pizza Hut in the US at one point, um, did a study and they found that Pizza Pizza was one of the most recognizable brands between five and 18 year olds in the city of Toronto at one point. Wow. Wow, that is that is crazy. And, and I mean, Pizza Pizza also has this crazed history of corporate infighting as one of the guys left to create Chicken Chicken. And <laughs> yep. it, it kind of went all over the place. Um, yep. But it remains the largest franchise in the city. Um, mm. And it, it, I mean, it's all over the place. And you see that orange sign, you know that phone number. I even heard at one point, if you lost your passport, um, back in the 80s or 90s, and you went to a consulate, they'd ask you, after seeing you're from Toronto, they'd say, what's the Pizza Pizza phone number? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's when you know it's a cultural thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and That's it's amazing. not just Pizza Pizza. A lot of these jingles that really got caught in people's heads as earworms um, serve mm -hmm. as that serious marketing item. Mm -hmm. um, I mean off the top of my head, 439-0000 Pizza Nova is one of the other big ones that stands out to me as well. Wow. What's been the, uh, basically the most, I don't want to use the term difficult, but what's been like a challenge with this kind of research? Has there any thing come up where it's just like either overwhelming or you can't find anything or? It was oral history participants for a while. Um, I was looking to speak to somebody, you know, who owned a pizza franchise or owned the conglomerate or was a delivery driver. And I got very lucky. Um, it was a tweet that ultimately got me in the office uh, with the Pizza Nova founder and his son, who's now the president. Um, I put out a call one day saying, I'm looking to talk to somebody who was a delivery driver. And one of my friends from my undergrad said, hey, talk to my dad. And honestly, half of a chapter is based around this guy's experiences as a delivery driver. Oh, it was wow. just stumbling upon these sources that, you know, I just kind of cast a net and I was lucky to find them. Yeah. Um, because even approaching some of the big franchises, they just didn't want to talk to me. You know, they're either not interested in their history or they're just afraid I'll bring up certain aspects of their history as well. Mm. That's interesting because they, they, they're uncomfortable with certain things possibly that they've... I, I'm sure... One that we just talked about that had a lot of legal battles in the 90s uh, related to chicken chicken and stock ownership. Yeah. I'm sure they didn't want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the other factor is a lot of the original owners are gone now. Um, businesses have 
in some cases have been handed down to second or third generation mm -hmm. who may not know the history um as well as the big franchises you know their businesses at the end of the day and nobody's really stopped to think about their history they right. how can we continue to make profit is their main goal mm -hmm. tell me about this uh pizza magazine yeah <laughs> canadian right. pizza magazine i know this is this is fantastic yeah it's the industry publication that i stumbled upon um i was down at uh pizza expo in las vegas nevada which in itself is which is another <laughs> that's a whole other thing i mean it's every oven manufacturer flour producer cheese maker wow. um the company that makes the cutters it, i walked around there for four or five days i had the worst blisters on my feet from walking around the <laughs> huge convention floor um yeah. and there was thousands of people there that was the biggest surprise but i discovered this industry publication that um, i've been lucky enough to write a few pieces for and I served as a judge for Canadian Pizza Expo uh, for their like pizza competition a few years nice. back. Nice. That's that's wild. I never heard of Canadian Pizza Magazine. Just... There, there's a few in the US as well. Um, yeah. A few different pizza trade publications. Um, and you know, it's the best way for like the tomato suppliers to reach their pizzerias. Um, I was shocked when I got that to this expo and you know every tomato supplier had full hospitality tents where you were like coming in and they're like here try every variety of tomato known to man <laughs> wow and then you're leaving with this big swag bag so it's like I look around my <laughs> desk and i have like all these weird pizza objects and i'm like oh yeah that was pizza expo a few yeah. years ago <laughs> that's crazy what what's the like the the one pizza event that you missed because of covid like it's the one thing you you want to go back to Expo was fantastic. Um, yeah. Canadian Pizza Expo, because I got to eat all the pizza as a judge. That was fantastic. Except oh, it was a secret menu challenge. Um, and it was green beans on pizzas. Hmm. It, it was, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. It was rough. They were yeah. like pickled green beans. I wasn't about that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, uh, what was one thing that you want, like... Like what? What's one thing you want the public to be aware of with this whole research? Because there's so much intertwined with it, and and it's so real, it's so interesting to me. I just it's like fascinating. Yeah, I think it's ultimately that it's not just that slice of pizza when you're thinking about it. It's the history behind how it got there. It, it's about the acceptance of Italians and the immigration of Italians, the growth of Italian communities. Um, you know, the fact that I can find three pizzerias within walking distance. That's the factor of suburbanization, right? Right. Or the fact that I can even turn to, say, like a Domino's, an American-based chain. Well, why is Domino's in Canada? Well, that's this big, long history of American branch plants um, and what I call branch plant franchises setting up in Canada. They come up here because they're able to operate their businesses at a cheaper cost than in the United States. And they're able to weave through the market, you know, using their big, big, big budgets, like a Pizza Hut. Why is Pizza Hut here? Well, it's because they could operate cheaper and they had multi, multi, multi million dollar advertising firms to push through to Canadian consumers. Right. I th that's what fascinated me last time I visited, uh, which was just recently. Uh, I was fascinated to see like Jersey Mike's and Popeye's and I, I knew Pizza Hut was up there, but the other, other franchises were, were moving in. And I'm like, I, it's just not like, like it was when I was growing up, where it was like that was more the American stuff. It was back there and you had your Canadian kind of mom and pop and and some of your Canadian corp, corporations there. Now you see it with other foods. And it's just wild. I was going to say it's always been other foods as well. Like I behind you right now, I can see the Colonel yeah. Um, yeah. from KFC. Yeah, and yeah. the colonel actually, and this is a fun little urban history here, he actually lived in Mississauga, Ontario for a very <laughs> long time. Um, after he sold off the American franchises, he still actually owned a big a big chunk of what was called Scott's Chicken Villa in Canada before it adapted the KFC name. And he actually lived in Mississauga, Ontario um, because he still had to maintain doing Canadian appearances as the colonel. Hmm. And oddly enough, his 
long legacy in Mississauga continues that the Heart and Stroke Center at the hospital is the Colonel Hartland Sanders Heart and Stroke Center, which, wow. I mean, there's definitely some irony related to the chicken in there. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking of my cholesterol now. But like McDonald's was here, uh, KFC, mm. uh, Subway comes in. Um, a lot of American franchises had roots moving to Canada, Taco Bell as well. Um, and we think of these like the American foods, like a fried chicken or a hamburger coming up. But it, this this domination and this change in the fast food industry extends beyond pizza, which we can think of as an ethnic food. We see it happen with Chinese food. We see it happen with Mexican food as well, just as quick examples. Mm -hmm. um, there's always been this changing game in the fast food industry from Ma and pa places or the independents to mm -hmm. these mass conglomerates. I mean, at one point, uh, Robin Hood, uh, which makes flour in Canada, Robin Hood Multi Foods, not only owned the flour company, they owned a frozen pizza brand, and they owned a chain of Canadian pizzerias. Um, pizza Patio and Pizza Delight were actually under this Robin Hood brand. Okay. So not only did they control the ownership of pizzerias, they controlled mm -hmm. what you were eating in your house when you made a frozen pizza and they're controlling the supply of flour to the pizzerias. Mm. And it, it's a little scary when you see how one conglomerate controlled all aspects of your pizza commodification. And right. that was mid late eighties. When, when we see the branches coming in and, and they start to push back against the independence uh, that obviously has, negative ramifications on a lot of mom and pop and independent pizzerias. Uh, but now we see, in my opinion, I'm starting to see a lot of our generation who are going back to independence uh, because they want to support small business. Have you seen that in recent years in the pre COVID era? Because we're not seeing a lot now during COVID we're doing a lot of takeout. Uh, have you seen that kind of coming to fruition in the Toronto slash York area as well? Uh, yeah, so we see a lot of the bigger brands still kind of like being the the powerful ones in the room. And that was a trend in the 80s as well. 80s and 90s is as these conglomerates are coming in, the independents have to look, how can we differentiate ourselves and our product to the standardized pizza, um, that quick pizza that's quickly produced by the franchises? Right. Well, you start offering a premium product like the California style or you really play up the Italian roots and that there is this Italian nationalism tied to an Italian person creating this pizza. Mm. Um, there was the movement towards a wood fired stove, right? Rather than an electric. Um, so turning back to more traditional Italian styles producing in a wood fire oven. Mm. Um, there's quite a few things going on um, in that regard. And I mean, it, it, it was also what else can you offer with your pizza? And that's where the chicken wing comes into play, uh, oh. especially in Buffalo. It right. was let's sell wings alongside our pizza. Let's start selling sub sandwiches or subs, grinders, hoagies, whatever you want to call them mm -hmm. alongside pizza, because that's what the franchises and conglomerates can't offer. But we as the local can continue to offer that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so how, how does this project in itself, how do you see it ending? Because it seems like it could be a thing where it consistently changes because of our what we're living through now and different changes in the business uh, aspect of it. Yeah, so when I was first set out on this project, I was very hard set about 1990 as the drop dead date. Mm -hmm. Because if I continued beyond that, way more conglomerates are popping up. Way more franchises are in, popping up. Independents are popping up and dying. And, right. you know, there's new trends constantly in pizza. Um, return to the fancy sit-down style pizza. The California pizza comes back. And that's where I was really hard that I stopped with 1990. Now, I mean, if an academic press wants to pick this up, I'm all for writing this book and continuing it on for another 20 years. Um, <laughs> right because it's not like the pizza history stops. It's still changing day to day. Um, mm -hmm. 1990 was just a drop date because it made things simpler. <laughs> it made yeah. things more controlled. Yeah. 
yeah, because I'm thinking of what life was like in the early and mid '90s, getting pizza as a kid, and it was like you had so many options because there were so many chains, and it was just overwhelming. And, and even uh, something as simple. So I, I talk about wings quite a bit um, in one of my chapters, and wings as an accompaniment to pizza super popular and as franchises start bringing them up to canada that's how canadians are now uh, sampling them but what happens with wings in themselves um as buffalonians and western new yorkers move down to florida for, for retirement well then there's this florida connection where all these wing franchises started to open in central and south florida uh, Hooters being one of the big ones uh, that comes out of that era. Um, but then all these other wing chains that open up, even to uh, Pizza Hut purchasing Wingstop. Um, right. That history is inherently tied to the pizza industry and is tied to Buffalo, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it, the amount of tangents I could have gone on. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking about this. This is like pizza is like the heart of this fast food industry. Even something like Chuck E. Cheese and the technological right. advancements that come from video games. Well, that's mm -hmm. tied to pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's yeah Nolan... I, I remember going to Chuck E. Cheese and all that stuff. And it was pizza and video games. Yeah. So that was Nolan Bushnell who leaves Atari. Um, mm -hmm. He's tasked with creating this uh family restaurant with animatronics because he's a big fan of disney so he creates the pizza time players and there's this whole history there as well it's not just chuck e cheese but there was pizza time theater and the two were actually rivals fighting each other um long story short guys left one company go to the other they steal proprietary software it wasn't just about the pizza anymore pizza was there but it became mm -hmm. about this technology. Mm -hmm. um, oven technology, that's a battleground. The pizza box, the corrugated container, that was another big battleground. It was actually Domino's who created what we'd really recognize as the corrugated pizza box. Wow. Yeah, that's that's like a whole other volume of work. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. You know. I, mean, I spent days trying to figure out who this woman, Carmela, um, Carmela, I, her last name's escaping me. She's the creator or the patent uh, holder behind the pizza saver. Hmm. Nobody knows who she is. Nobody knows why she created it. Doesn't appear that she owned a pizzeria or a factory that could actually produce these things. And then hmm. after 10 years or whatever, the patent expires and she doesn't pick it up again. I spent solid days trying to figure out who she was. And the closest I got was she was maybe a councilwoman in New Jersey at one point. Wow. Okay. Carmela Vitale. That's her name. Wow. And there, I spent days trying to figure out who this per person was. And the right. best, best answer I can give is uh, she was most likely Italian and somehow connected through family to a pizzeria and hmm. produced this for them. But why did she come up with this little plastic table to prevent the crushing of toppings? Yeah. We'll never know. <laughs> yeah. That's one of my great mysteries. Yeah, that is weird. That is weird. So so do you uh, do you agree with me that Chicago pizza is a casserole? <laughs> no. I became no. friends over the course of this project with um, Kendall, who owned the U.S. Uh, U.S. Pizza History Museum, which was in Chicago. Oh, nice. And I sat down with him and another pizza writer when we were in Las Vegas, and we actually had this back and forth debate. And I was going, <laughs> it's pretty close to a casserole, guys. And they, go, they go, there's dough, there's sauce, there's cheese. And I go, that's my definition of a pizza. It's close to a casserole. It's close <laughs> to a pizza. It's some sort of gray zone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when it's when it's like this thick, it's, that's a casserole. Well, the, all <laughs> all the non pizza pizza products, so pizza pockets, the calzone, the uh, pizza roll, stromboli, all of these items that are kind of pizza like, but not quite a pizza. Right. That's been one of those areas where I've always said it's a bit of a gray area, but you know they try to be a pizza, so I'm going to call them a pizza. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Those little pretzel bites that I like, you know, that are pizza flavored. Oh, like, the combos. Oh, with I the, love those. I could yep. eat those all day. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can send me a bag of those if you want. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, give me your address offline. I'll send you some. <laughs> we'll have a care. We'll have a COVID care package. Um, yeah, that's that shows you how much pizza has influenced us as a culture for food because it's like it's in a lot of other things or this this is supposed to taste like a pepperoni pizza or this is supposed to taste like a cheese pizza chips now have this and all kinds of stuff it's crazy and if we think about it somebody who's in say their 70s or 80s mm -hmm. within their lifetime pizza was once considered that strange foreign food that they probably wouldn't touch and now it's right. so ubiquitous with modern life that, mm -hmm. you know, you can find a slice anywhere. You can find pizza flavored goldfish crackers or whatever. Yeah, just, yeah Mel Melissa just said that. Pizza goldfish. Pizza yeah. goldfish. I love those. Yeah. But you have to think within some people's lifetime that are still living, mm -hmm. pizza was this strange foreign food that they weren't too sure about. Yeah, it's like me telling my friends about beaver tails. Exactly. It, it's... Yeah. Oh, that sounds weird. Why would I eat that? Right. Like, Why do you eat a beaver tail? It's like, I, I think with pizza, it, it is this ethnic Italian element to it that scared people away at one point. And mm -hmm. it was this gradual acceptance of Italian immigrants to larger urban communities that ultimately solidifies the acceptance of pizza and Italian foodways into non-Italian uh, communities. Do you have that... Uh in canada as much as we did here in the states where you have this movement especially early on where we're going to remove the hyphen from from people you're not italian american or italian canadian you're just canadian or you're just american and that influences how people see this kind of stuff or is that kind of like so in the buffalo case there's definitely the you're just yeah. american eventually yeah. but in the canadian case i think it holds pretty strong that you're italian canadian even be it second or third generation, foodways and the traditional production of, you know, dishes, that's something that's handed generation to generation. And that's ultimately why some of these independent pizzerias are able to survive because they have this assumed traditional knowledge that's passed down. And they mm -hmm. really take pride in the uh, production or procurement of certain goods to produce their pizza. Mm -hmm. um, even Pizza Nova, that's a second generation. It's the son is now in charge of the company, but they really take pride in where they source all their products from. And mm -hmm. to the point that they all come into one central hub before going out to their pizzerias so they can really control the produce and the quality of tomatoes that like they were even importing their tomatoes up until the 90s. Wow. Wow. Alex, uh, before we wrap up, I have to ask this question from a technical aspect. Uh, what does your supervisor think of this project and, and your secondary uh, supervisors uh, think of think how, how much this has grown and like become a part of your existence the last few years? I, I, I knew I was with a great supervisor when I sat down in her office one day and I said a dissertation on pizza and she didn't laugh. And hmm. I started unfolding all these elements I wanted to look at. And she went, you're really looking at everything. Um, and I've been very lucky with my two other committee members. Uh, one is a specialist on Toronto, Buffalo, and the other is a specialist on uh, urban spaces, as well as the GIS mapping element that I got into as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they've all really supported this project um, and the curiosity that they bring to the project. Um, things that, you know, I started to take for granted, like, oh yeah, that's a corrugated B style box. <laughs> well, what is a corrugated B style yeah, box? I didn't know there were different ones. Uh, don't, yeah. I have a whole book on it somewhere. <laughs> you have them all in your room there. It's yeah. like your stack. <laughs> I, yeah. I did have a stack of pizza boxes at one point. My wife made me get rid of those. <laughs> See, it's like me with Funkos. It's like just, just stack them <laughs> up in the background. It's fine. No, this is a B and this is an A. And exactly. A. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fascinating because uh, some of us have experienced that in grad school where we've uh, said, well, I want to write this as a thesis or whatever. And sometimes the professor has been like, no one's going to want to read that. that yeah. I don't understand that. So that's why it's really interesting to hear other people's experience, especially when they're having a... a I don't want to call it a non-traditional topic, but it's it's one of those things where it's like some people wouldn't have thought of this. Yeah. And I, I love having hearing that there are advisors out there who are and supervisors at, in the graduate level who are just genuinely as curious as you are. I mean, if we take a step back and even look at my master's where I worked on Disneyland, 
Um, a yeah. lot of my cohort at that time were military historians and they were all going Disneyland. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that the Disneyland guy moves on to become the pizza guy um, speaks a lot, but it, it speaks Thank to you. having great supervisors who see the potential in these very out there uh, cultural histories. But I, this is at the end of the day, this isn't just a cultural history. It's a food history. It's a business history, economic history, labor history, social history, history of consumption. I could go on with this list. Um, history of technology at times. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's making sure you work with somebody who really sees that light in that strange project. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Alex, I really appreciate you coming on here and being a part of this live stream. I can't wait to hear how the defense goes and, and Karen says the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I wish we could live stream that. That would be amazing. But yeah, we might have to with COVID uh, protocols. <laughs> might have to. I'll somehow, I'll somehow get in the uh, Zoom uh, defense of this and be like, "What's what's he doing here?" Uh, but no, this is fascinating, Alex. I really appreciate you coming on because uh, you actually brought this up in a Twitter uh, thing that I did uh, for anyone out there who wants to. Uh, network pretty easily on Twitter. Just ask people what they're working on, and and they will tell you what they're working on. And Alex is one of those who jumped into the, the Twitter uh, links there into the thread and said, "I'm working on this thing about pizza history." And I'm like, "Whoa, hold on here! I need to hear about this. This is totally different, and I love it." So you never know who you're going to network with, and and I'm so glad that we've been able to give you uh, some time to shed some light on this, Alex. And I know that. We could go on for six hours if we wanted to. And, and the next hour would be about boxes and then the next hour about something else. But I really appreciate you coming on, Alex, and doing this. It really means a lot to me. And I know it means a lot to the people here who are uh, watching us. Uh, thanks for having me. And thanks for everybody who tuned in this evening. Yes. And, and, and be well up there. Hopefully, I'll get to visit the Toronto slash York area uh, after this next wave dies down. And we'll go to McDonald's for some coffee and think about the pizza. And we can grab a slice somewhere. Yeah, well, yeah, you can show me around where to grab I'll a slice. I'll show you the good spots. Yeah, 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 you have to do that. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Alex and I tonight. We really do appreciate that. We hope you're staying happy and healthy. Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, be well, be safe, keep reading, and we will chat with you later.